Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. I have sought thy face, thy face, O Lord, I will seek. Turn not away thy face from me. Words taken from the introit, from the collect for today, Sunday after ascension, we heard. Almighty and everlasting God, make us always bear towards thee a devoted will and serve thy majesty with a sincere heart. And finally, from the Alleluia verse, we heard, I will not leave you orphans. I go away and I come unto you and your heart shall rejoice. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Once a certain farmer was given to stealing his neighbor's corn, concerned that he might get caught. He took his son with him to act as a lookout, a sentinel. Nervous, he would ask his son if he saw anyone coming, saying, anyone coming from the left? No, dad. Anyone coming from the right? Nope. Then the son said, dad, shouldn't we be looking up there it is. There are eyes in heaven, human eyes. Our Lord is there with his human body looking at us. Are we looking up at him? Have we sought his face? Or we could ask, where is our heart? If it is in heaven, we will think about and desire and love heavenly things. If it is on earth, we will think about and desire and love earthly things and even sinful things. From the scholastics, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, and so on, we know that the charity is the form of all the virtues. Charity, the theological virtue of charity is the form of all the virtues. A fancy way of saying, without charity, none of the virtues will work. They won't be an act. Think of charity as being like the water in which virtues swim like beautiful fish. They cannot swim unless charity is present. They have to breathe in this water of, to receive life-giving grace. In this way, we can see that charity, love of God and love of neighbor, is what moves, motivates Man to do good that lasts, true good, supernatural good, meritorious good. We can easily map out the entire spiritual life with charity in mind. We know that when we die, we're placed in heaven according to the charity in our souls. We can map out the entire spiritual life with charity in mind. We first receive charity in our souls at baptism giving us what is called essential perfection. That is to say, we have all we need in kernel form. We have all the essential needs to perfect charity in our souls and make it to heaven. The completeness of charity is only possible in heaven. And this is called final perfection. So at one end, we have essential perfection. At the other, we have final perfection. And really, our charity, our perfection, is only complete after the general resurrection of the dead, having our bodies reunited with their souls. So that everyone in heaven will be finally and completely whole. Nothing missing. And this shows us how important is the ascension of our Lord and the assumption of Our Lady, and perhaps St. Joseph too, who the majority, I believe, of theologians hold that his body is in heaven too. They're glorified bodies in heaven, complete and united with their souls. They are perfect, complete in every way. Now, in between this initial essential perfection and this final perfection, he states lie the operative perfection our life in this world, wherein we work out our salvation, striving anew day by day to live a more charitable life in Christ, 
filling in the holes caused by sin and healing its wounds. Today, in order to deepen our understanding of the ascension and working out our perfection, with a little help from St. Vincent Ferrer, let's use this principle of charity. Whenever a thing is ardently loved, it draws to itself the mind and the heart of the lover. Whenever a thing is ardently loved, it draws to itself the mind and the heart of the lover. Some analogies from nature. The heat of the sun draws upward the vapors of the earth. The flame of the lamp draws to itself, little by little, all the oil in the vessel. In the same way, a person ardently loved draws the lover to think of her in his heart, induces his mouth to speak of her, his eyes to look at her, for such is the nature of love. Does not our Lord say, where your treasure is, there is your heart also? Applying this to his majesty, we know that the apostles and other disciples most ardently loved his physical presence among them. St. Mary Magdalene would not let him go. This should not be wondered at when we consider the sweetness of his words, the kindness of his demeanor, the light that shone from his eyes and even from his body. His very presence made them exceedingly glad and made him exceedingly lovable. After all, in the litany of the sacred heart, we say he is the furnace, the burning furnace of charity and the abyss of all virtue. And virtue is lovable. God is love, says St. John, and our Lord is love incarnate, making him supremely lovable in every way. Yet the disciples were too attached to his bodily presence with the result that the desire of heavenly goods was not deeply impressed upon them, upon their hearts. As long as Christ was present with them bodily on earth, they did not bother to raise their hearts and their minds to heaven. They had what they needed. He was right there before them. Even as our Lord was about to ascend into heaven, the disciples asked, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking about an earthly kingdom, not a heavenly one. Recall that when our Lord told them during the Last Supper that he was leaving them, their hearts were troubled and afraid. He has gone to heaven. And many hearts, even now, are troubled and afraid. We feel him gone. We need to look up and conquer this unhealthy fear. And so, in order to make those who love him raise their minds and hearts to heavenly things, he went to heaven with his human nature, removing it from our senses. He's still here, physically, in the Eucharist, but he's removed himself from our senses so that we do not become attached to him and so that we will look up and see him in heaven and desire him and let him draw us to him. He went to heaven in order to raise our minds to heavenly things. He went to heaven with his human nature, removing it from our senses, that we will love what has gone up in heaven and be heavenly. This is the reason why it was expedient, not only for the apostles and disciples, and for, but for us too, that he should ascend. For no one would set his heart on heaven if our blessed Lord and beloved Lord were not there in his human nature, drawing us like seeks like. He wants to draw us into his one act of divine love, and so he has ascended to make this possible, completely possible, finally possible. Whenever a thing is ardently loved, that's our principle, it draws to itself the mind and the heart of the lover. Thus, St. Paul says, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Alas, how sad. Yet the apostles were hampered in the reception of spiritual graces by their too earthly love for Christ. What impediments there must be for us 
unhappy ones that we are, who do not love his majesty as ardently as the apostles did. How many of us center our affections on passing goods of this world, honors, human respect, riches, dignities of position, carnal pleasures, which do not permit us to raise our hearts on high, but lower them to the level of earthly business. Let us fight this human tendency. We have the means to do so. We have our Lord. By obeying the command of St. Paul to set our minds and hearts on heavenly things, we can conquer. And I'm going to show you how. Using charity, making a connection between here and heaven, we can do it. Love of God and love of neighbor is possible. In that order, by the way, always connecting them to heaven for maximum effectiveness. So I recommend in our prayers, in attendance at Holy Mass, in our reception of Holy Communion, let us ask for his majesty reigning perfectly in heaven and on our altars to make us love him and be made like unto him. Let us beg him to remove all blockages to our final perfection. This can, I think, I suggest, be easily done with the famous prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the Anima Christi. After communion, or even during Mass, we can pray, Soul of Christ, be my sanctification. And we add piously, Illumine my mind with your thoughts. Move my will with your will to hate what you hate and to love what you love. Inflame my gifts of the Holy Ghost with your gifts of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, piety, fear of the Lord, and courage. With your memory, cleanse and perfect my memory. Make me love thee more and more. Make my mind and my soul like yours. You're thinking about heaven now. You're connecting to Christ in heaven. Keep it going. Body of Christ, the prayer goes on. Be my salvation. Piously, we add, O oh, body of Christ, save me from my faults and failings. Save me from the wickedness and snares of the devil. Make my body like yours, pure and chaste and ultimately glorified. Pray this way the Lord will hear you. Blood of Christ, the prayer goes on, fill all my veins. O blood of Christ, fill me with faith, hope, and charity, we piously add, with prudence, with justice, temperance, and courage, with humility, meekness, patience, chastity, and obedience, and with all virtue, most especially with charity, so that I will love you above all things. The prayer goes on. Water from Christ's side, wash out my stains. Grant me the grace of compunction, tears. Because with these tears, we can wipe out all our stains of sin. Beg for this grace. Water from Christ's side, wash out my stains. Grant me the grace of compunction habitual contrition for having sinned. Passion of Christ, the prayer goes on, my comfort to be. We can add, strengthen and order my passions as yours are to suffer for you and carry out your holy will. Make me fight the good fight and run the good race, nay, to be crucified and naked to the world upon the cross. For you, draw me unto you, stripped and detached from all things of the world. Beg and plead. O oh, good Jesus, listen to me. In thy wounds I long to hide, never to be parted from thy side. The prayer goes on. Never let me leave your holy church, we can add. Never let me break or deny my vows of baptism. That's what it means to never be parted from his side. And finally, Guard me when the, my foe assails me. Guide me when my feet shall fail me. Bid me come to thee above. 
with thy saints to sing thy love forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful prayer. What a powerful prayer. Love wants what is best for the loved one, we say. And so love incarnate has gone ahead to prepare a place in heaven for the loved one and even to draw them to himself. Connecting love of God to Christ Jesus in heaven will enable us to be with him in heaven forever. You will become another Christ. But he also demands that we do what he has done. That is, he commands us to love one another. This is the rub of being a Christian. St. Peter in the lesson today, before all things have a constant mutual charity amongst yourselves, for charity covereth a multitude of sins. And so love of God and love of neighbor go together. They're closely allied. They go together and cannot be separated. Imitating his majesty's love for us, his removal of obstacles, our love of neighbor does the same. It seeks to remove obstacles, any obstacles that we can, that may be in their path to final perfection. How easy it is to do nothing, or worse yet, to add to them. Saying things like this, well, he made his bed, let him lie in it. We made our bed too, and God did not let us lie in it. He got us out. We have to help others too. Consider a few obstacles of love of neighbor. Our selfishness, we look upon them as an object. Utility. And we have what it takes to conquer the self-centeredness. So for example, big problem today, we take a second look at the flesh of another. They've shown so much. You tend to want to look. It's human nature. We can then think, and catch ourselves, we can say, I wonder what the flesh of Christ looks like in heaven. Most beautiful and light-filled it be, and not conducive to lust at all. If we make this connection, the desire for the human flesh here on earth just fades away. Try it. See if I'm not right. Find your eyes wandering for whatever reason. What are the eyes of his majesty looking upon? They're looking upon the light of glory. And they're looking upon the blessed virgin and St. Joseph for their bodies are there. You know, St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic, our Lord revealed himself to her slowly because she couldn't take it all at once. And he showed her his hand. So beautiful was just the hand of Christ. She went immediately into an ecstasy upon seeing it. So beautiful is the flesh of Christ. Make the connection, folks. It will rescue you from many, many traps. Another big obstacle and a big one is lack of forgiveness for wrongs done. The devil loves it. And he clings on to it when he finds it. And he gets his way into our life. And we live our life with these resentments we can't let go of. Some incident happened in our life and we live with it the rest of our lives. And the devil uses it against us. Are you going to let that go on? Charity gives us a way out of these resentments and injustices. The saints looked at their neighbor's from the perspective of heaven, and then all became clear. Listen to St. Thomas More put this into words. Why should I now, he wrote as he was approaching death, hate one for this while who shall hereafter love me forevermore? And why should I be now then an enemy to him with whom I shall in time be coupled in eternal friendship? If we're going to be to heaven together, we're going to love each other there. I'm going to start now. That's his point. And then he says this, but on the other side, if he will continue to be wicked and be damned and go to hell, then it, is there such an outrageous eternal sorrow before this poor man that I may well think myself a deadly cruel wretch 
if I would not now rather pity his pain than malign his person. Well, he got what he deserved. No, pity the poor fool. If besides, if we do not forgive them and strive to do so, we may well join him. Here is a part of a prayer he wrote shortly before his death. Almighty God, have mercy on, and he said, fill in the blank, N or N. N and N, you know, Cromwell, King Henry. And on all that bear me evil will and would harm me, have mercy on them. And by such easy, tender, and merciful means as thine infant wisdom can devise, Grant that their faults and mine may both be amended and redressed. Here it is. Here's the key line. And make us saved souls in heaven together. Where we may ever live and love together with thee and thy blessed saints, O glorious Trinity, grant this for the sake of the bitter passion of our sweet Savior Christ. Amen. There's the key line. You're mad at somebody. You want them gone. Say, may we be saved souls together in heaven. Tempted to say something bad about someone. Condemn them for their dumb things they've done in their life. Say, may we be saved souls together in heaven. And it disarms it. It works. His majesty has sent into heaven, dearly beloved, to make final perfection of charity, the form of all virtues, very real and possible for all his faithful. Let us keep looking up always to follow his lead and respond to his graces to do the very same, to work out our salvation and seeking perfect love of God and neighbor. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.